Hello and welcome. This is video three, the final video for this class called Is Everyone Here? Strategies for Finding Complete English Families. I am Jana Greenouch, accredited genealogist, and this class is part of the ICAP Gen Track offered for Roots Tech Connect. If you have watched the other two videos of the series, and I hope you have, then Congratulations! Thanks for staying with me. I'm really excited for this last video. In the first video, I introduced the concept of looking for missing children, making sure you're finding everybody when you research a family from the past. We talked about analyzing family groups, looking for gaps between children, and asking questions to help us look in the right places. In the second video, I shared some tips for using censuses and civil registration indexes to find complete families. And now it's time to dig even deeper and delve into church and probate records. These are especially critical records prior to the 1800s when censuses and civil registration did not exist in England. So let's jump in. We'll start with church records. Here's a quick history lesson. The Church of England was formed in the 1530s when King Henry VIII severed ties with the Catholic Church in Rome, and an order was made requiring English parishes to record christenings, marriages, and burials. In 1598, we get another order requiring that the parishes make a copy of their parish registers and, and regularly send them to the bishop of their diocese. And this has worked out very nicely for family historians since it means there are two copies of these records. That's very handy if one gets destroyed or if one is more easily accessible online than the other. The vast majority of English people from the past can be found in Church of England records. So as we're trying to research complete families, we can use parish registers and, and the bishop's transcript copies to search for christenings of children and also burials of children. And while we're talking about burials, don't forget the headstones themselves in English churchyards can be very valuable records for helping us to find family members. The inscriptions on the stones often include more detail than the burial records, including relationship information. And what's more, you could learn a few things by taking note of which stones are next to each other in a churchyard. Maybe there are children buried next to your ancestor's stone that you didn't know he had. Many monumental inscriptions, as we call them, are becoming available online, so you don't always have to travel to the churchyard to use these records, although I highly recommend it. England is a lovely place to visit. So let me tell you a story about that. My husband and I were visiting England. We were driving around to small villages to walk around churchyards looking at headstones. It's one of my very favorite things to do. And I paid a visit to my ancestor's church and had a good look at his headstone. Now, I had seen this stone before. Someone had already taken a picture of this beautiful stone and posted it online. So I didn't have to travel from my home in the United States all the way to England to see it. But since I was there anyway, I had a close look, glanced down at the bottom of the stone, pulled the overgrown grass back just a bit, and I found another inscription. Apparently a grandson, John, was buried there too. And I immediately began a research project to discover who this little John was because our family records did not include anyone that matched this John. Which of my ancestors' children did he belong to? It's been a fascinating research problem. The parish registers for this particular church are in pretty bad, sh bad shape. So it's been challenging, but I have narrowed it down to just a couple of options of who his parents might have been. And what is clear already is that no one in our family knew about this boy, not until we pulled the grass back on Grandpa's headstone. Little John here, he is part of our family and we want his story recorded. So don't forget to use monumental inscriptions and visit the churchyard if you can. 
Let me offer a few tips for those who are trying to reconstruct families using christening and burial records. First of all, images are better than indexes. Definitely use the indexes. They can save a lot of time. But when I'm really trying to fill in gaps in a family and find everybody, I look at the images too to make sure that the indexer didn't miss something. Indexes don't always transcribe names correctly. They may miss some important note in the margin. For many years, my husband didn't know who his ancestor Judith's father was because her christening was the very last one on the page where there was a bit of a smudge and the indexer skipped the entry. But because we combed through the actual images of the parish christenings, instead of simply relying on the index, we found her down there at the bottom and learned that she was the illegitimate daughter of Alice Holker and, if you look closely, Thomas Williams, a weaver from Worsley. Also, remember that families didn't always stay in the same place, and even if they did, they may have bounced around to different churches sometimes, even neighboring parishes or nonconformist or non-Church of England churches. If you're noticing a gap in the Church of England christening records for a family, it's not impossible that they took their child somewhere else to be baptized or that they weren't baptized at all. In the case of one of my ancestors, he didn't seem to care much about having his children christened. I've only located christening records for two of his six children. Uh, and in this example on the slide, they happen to be visiting the grandparents' parish across the country when they christened one of their children. In the other example, their daughter was uh, christened just before she passed away as a toddler, as if they were hurrying and taking care of it just in case, since she was on her deathbed. And unless you are researching really common names in big cities, it can be very helpful to create lists of every instance of a surname in a town. In the absence of other record types and in very early research, church records are sometimes all we have to work with. So I like to get a big piece of paper or a whiteboard when I do this and collect all the christenings and marriages and burials in a parish that have the same surname and see if you can't just arrange them into families using the parents' names. And you'll start to visualize how many of the families are connected. You'll notice naming patterns. That's a, a very broad way to put families together, but I do find zooming out and looking at all the options for a surname can be very helpful. And this is especially helpful in small parishes where people didn't move around much. Uh, this, this would be much harder to do in a large city, and the closer you get to the present time, the more often people were really moving ar around their uh, the country out of their home parishes. So this has limited application, but when we have nothing else to work with in early research, mapping it out like this can be quite productive. Okay, let's move on to probate records. We've already talked about the three most commonly used English record types, that's censuses, civil registration, and church records. I call them the three C's. But arguably the next most important record type for English research is probate records. The problem with probate records, and, and the reason they're not as common, commonly used as the three C's, is that not everyone left a will, but if they did, you definitely want to see it. it. It's possible that you could learn a lot about a person's family, including who their living children were through a will. Or, or even you could learn from the paperwork for the administration of a person's property who didn't leave a will. We call those admons. You wouldn't learn as much from them, but you could learn some. And there's even another kind of probate record that many are less familiar with because it's actually a tax record. It's called an estate duty or a death duty record. All, all of these probate records can be so valuable that even though you may not find the person you're looking for, it's always worth checking. And you can find people from all classes of society in probate records. Wills won't mention deceased children usually, but they could certainly help you find living children that you may have missed in your other research. 
Another reason probate records are less used is that they're a little bit complicated to find and use. So let me just give you a little overview of how you go about using these records. Probate was originally handled by the church, but in 1858, a new system was established that took it out of the church's hands, and this changes how we search for them. So from 1858 to the present, you will search a national index to discover whether or not your ancestor has a will or an administration. And you can do this at gov.uk or Ancestry uh, using the national probate calendar that's available there. If you find them in the index, then you can uh, go ahead and obtain the will itself at gov.uk or FamilySearch has filmed them, so you can access them through their catalog. Before 1858, probates are handled by the church courts, and the process is a little more complicated, but it's doable. Here's my approach. The Family Search Wiki has county probate pages which can help you to determine which church court your ancestor likely died in, and then they'll provide you with links to online indexes for those courts. And once you've found an entry in an index, then you can go ahead and locate the actual probate records. Many of them are online, and I've listed some of the sites that are most useful for viewing images of wills online. Now, we don't have time to go very deep into how these records work, but just in case it sparks a good idea for you, let me give you a couple more tips about using probate records to find complete families. Don't forget to search broadly. Maybe dad didn't leave a will, but Try mom, especially if she died after dad, or try big brothers or sisters or aunts or uncles. It's possible that you will learn about extended family re relationships in these wills. This is another place where I would search the probate indexes for all instances of my family's surname in an area, just like with the church records, unless, of course, it's a really big town, because doing it that way could help you to piece together extended families, just like we talked about with, um, with the church records. Additionally, uh, estate duty records or the inheritance tax created paperwork that may actually list more heirs or children than the actual probate records themselves, so they're worth a look. Okay, I've given you a lot of detail in this video, and I want to share an example of how these records can help you to find complete families. Let me introduce you to a family that became more complete after I used church and probate records to research them. They were a little bit too early for censuses and civil registration records. I knew my ancestor Alice was the daughter of Thomas and Sarah Horobin. Using the christening records in their parish, I located eight of Alice's siblings. It looked pretty good. Big family, kids were spaced nicely every two to three years. I found the parents were married in 1773, just before the beginning of this 21 year spread of childbearing for Sarah. I, I could have stopped researching there and been pretty comfortable. But because I know how very wonderful probate records can be, I made a quick search to see if any probate records existed for this family. Father Thomas did not leave a will, neither did the mother, Sarah. Big brother James did. And he happened to mention his siblings, all of the siblings that you see listed here, except for the few who had passed away prior to the time of his will. So he mentions his one brother, John, and then on this page of his will, all surviving sisters. And here they are, even listed with their married names. Very helpful. It matches the list of christenings I found perfectly, even in age order, except there's an extra here. The first one listed, Martha Nutt. There was no Martha in the christening records, despite a thorough double check. But clearly, she is part of this family. She is one of the surviving sisters of James. Searched the marriage records in the parish and confirmed that, sure enough, there was a Martha Horobin who had married a Mr. Nutt. And I was more than thrilled to add her into my family group sheet for the Thomas and Sarah Horobin family. You never know what you might find when you dig into the records in search of missing family members. To summarize the important points of this series, 
As we research our English families, please remember, always ask the question, is everyone here? And don't assume anything until you have a solid explanation for each gap in the family group sheet. Expect census and civil registration records to help fill those holes in the more recent generations and rely on church and probate records to help you anytime, but especially early on. Don't forget the little etc. at the end of this slide. There are other lesser known record types that can help too. A few that we referenced in this series were monumental inscriptions on headstones, newspapers and court records, uh, estate duty tax records, and there are more. We'll return to the beginning, the moral of the series. I am a mother and I care deeply about my own seven children. They are each one of them a very important part of our family story. So please, for the mothers of the past, if you can help it, don't leave anyone out. I wish you the very best in your English research endeavors and I hope you enjoy the rest of Roots Tech Connect.